Please again put your hands together for Mr. John Romero. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the very first Yorkshire Games Festival. Um, all right, so uh, I'm John Romero, co founder of id Software, and I'm going to take you on a journey back to the beginning of id Software. Are you ready to be entertained? All right, how many of you are programmers? All right, that's excellent. <laughs> um, so I do realize that some of what I'm about to say may sound insane, but we were in our 20s when we started in software and we didn't know there were any limits. So I grew up in a wonderful small town in Northern California named Rockland with a population of only 6,000 people. In the 70s, I was massively addicted to spending loads of time in dark arcades and playing all the games there and getting really good at them. People didn't have computers at home. So in 1979, before anyone had computers, including me, I went to the local college when I was 11 years old. And I started to learn basic from the college students. I just went up to them and I asked them what the words were in their listings, like what, what those words meant. And I wrote them down on paper and I experimented with them on the HP 9000 mainframe that was there. So to keep me at home, my parents got an Apple II Plus and I was done going outside. <laughs> I spent all my time programming games on that computer. So a few years and 20 Apple II games later, I finally learned 6502 assembly language, which was the language that all fast arcade games were written in back then. Then I could really make 80s games like these, but uh, not, not quite arcade games, but home computer games <laughs> like these. So those are on the Apple II. So let's just say that the Apple II is my personal home arcade, as well as one million other Apple owners. So when I was a sophomore in high school, uh, I was here in England at RAF Alkenbury in Cambridgeshire and I did some programming for the Air Force when I was 15 years old and I can't tell you what I was programming because that's classified. <laughs> but after high school I kept making games and by 1987 I was working at Origin Systems. My first job was porting 2400 AD from the Apple II to the Commodore 64. By this time, I'd made 74 games and three previous startup companies, Capital Idea Software, Inside Out Software, where I ported Might and Magic 2 to the Commodore 64, and Ideas from the Deep, and I was 21 years old. So I went to work at a company named Softdisk at the start of 1989. I learned how to program a DOS PC there, and I made a small game or a utility per month for about a year. Then I created a game product called Gamer's Edge at Softdisk, and I had to hire a team of game developers. So I hired John Carmack and Adrian Carmack, not related, into my department for programming and art. Tom Hall came in at night to help us out since he was already at Softdisk and he loved making games. This was the first time that any of us had worked together with another person on a game after making these game, our own games alone for 10 years each. So it was incredible. While creating our first game together, which was called Slordax, John Carmack discovered the smooth scrolling trick on the PC. Tom Hall and John stayed up until 5 a.m. making a demo called Dangerous Dave in Copyright Infringement. The next day, I saw the disc on my desk, and I ran the demo, 
and I watched the screen scroll smoothly pixel by pixel. It was a massive eureka moment for me. It was like a bolt of lightning. I'll elaborate on why in a moment. But in software was born that instant on September 20th of 1990. So one thing led to another, and we spent a week putting together a demo of Super Mario 3 that we wanted to send to Nintendo. So they got it, and they really liked it, but they decided not to publish it because they decided to only publish their games on their own NES platform, which was a really smart move back then. So no problem, we used the tech for a different game, the Commander Keen Trilogy. So why would a side-scroller be a huge hit on PCs in 1990? Well, because no games on the PC could scroll smoothly per pixel. The PC had been out since August of 1981, but in nine years, no one had figured out how to make the screen scroll smoothly per pixel until that Dangerous Dave in copyright infringement demo, which led to Commander Kane. So does anybody remember the original Duke Nukem game pictured there? Yeah, <laughs> side scrolling. It scrolled by chunks of eight pixels like other games uh, of that era. The reason why it scrolled with any speed is uh, because I taught Todd Replogle how to do it while he was coding Dark Ages, which was the game he made just before Duke Nukem. So the Commander Keen trilogy provided the start of the company, and we made these three games in three months from September 20th to December 20, 14th, 1990. And uh, it was a massive hit for us. And it was so popular that people cosplayed as Keen for years at events. The game pioneered the creation of game engines. So we designed the game as an engine that operated on different, uh, different data for different games. It was the only way to get the trilogy done so quickly. In fact, in 1991, when we were working on Keen 4, we started licensing the engine for the first time. It was the beginning of the modern engine licensing business. So develop, development on our games went smoothly and quickly because we stuck to some core principles that are important even, to today, even today. So through this talk, I'm gonna highlight some of our core principles. I'd like to highlight something else right now, namely this photo. Has anyone seen this before? No? All right. <laughs> um, so it's a picture of us at our lake house in Shreveport, Louisiana, where we started in software. Um, the funny thing is that, for, uh, is that people have asked me for years what was in this picture. So I analyzed it recently, and here's what you see. <laughs> this is uh, John and me in uh, early September of 1990. We were working on the Super Mario 3 demo that we planned on send sending to Nintendo. We both worked on this huge D&D table that John had. We used to play D&D on the weekends, and those sessions led to ideas for future games like Doom and Quake. So Tom Hall took this photo. Um, we brought the computers home from work on the weekends. So this pic was taken on a Saturday or a Sunday. On top of the monitor is one of those old Intel reflective astronaut plushies. And to my left is my notepad, which was a task list of bugs to fix. This is our high level task list of what we had to get done to finish the demo. It's just a whiteboard. Um, this is Tom Hall's area where he was doing all the graphics for the demo. He recorded gameplay on a VCR and he played it back and paused the action so he could duplicate the tiles exactly in Deluxe Paint 2, <laughs> not Photoshop. Uh, the TV set had a 13 channel selector on it, so it was ancient, uh, and it was connected by an RF modulator, so very old school. So its software was founded, uh, formally founded on February 1st of 1991, and we made 12 games that year. Shadow Knights, da Danger Save in the Haunted Mansion, Rescue Rover, etc. cetera. Um, we actually took two months to make each game, but we made two games simultaneously. This was due to us having 10 years of intense game development experience prior to this, um, but it was also due to our first principle. Uh, no prototypes, just make the game. Polish as you go, don't depend on polish happening later. Always maintain constantly shippable code. 
This is how we made so many games so quickly. We had the entire game in our heads. We just needed to quantify what needed to be done, and we went about working on it until the game was finished. There were no prototypes for our games. We just made them. You know, remember, we had a small team of four people, and we could do this. Uh, today, large teams definitely require planning and some prototyping. So time for a quick story. Um, one day it rained really hard, and Cross Lake in Louisiana rose up, and it was flooding everywhere. I needed to get to work. We were furiously working away on our games, and I had to get back into it. And I just got showered and everything, and drove down the road, and then I saw this. Uh, the entire road was flooded. So basically, I waded through the, the flood. His car couldn't get through it. Uh, dodging water snakes and everything all the way to the house. Um, then took another shower and got back to work. <laughs> we were all so excited to, to be making our own games 24-7. Also note that during this year of 12 games, we moved id Software from Louisiana to Wisconsin. So that takes a bit of time out of game development. We couldn't afford to have anything go wrong while making our games at such a pace. And we created another principle that kept us developing quickly. Uh, it's incredibly important that your game can always be run by your team. Bulletproof your engine by providing defaults upon load failure. So if you have 100 people trying to develop a game that will not run, you're paying for 100 people to sit around and wait for it to get fixed. So we recognize the importance of keeping the game always playable and decided to bull bulletproof our game, our engine, by making all of the input solid. So game engines typically fail when they're trying to load bad or corrupted or non-existent data. So checking for this and providing a default for a failure case will keep the game running quick and quickly show you what's missing. So if you fail to load a sprite, just show a bagel. You know, if the theme song isn't loading, play something obviously wrong for the game. So if you're missing a sound effect, play something really annoying. So the, uh, after 1991, id Software's first stage of company development was complete and another important principle was in effect. Keep your code absolutely simple. Keep looking at your functions and figure out how you can simplify even further. We wrote all our games up to and including Quake in C, not C++. So stage two is about to begin for id Software. In August of 1991, we decided to move to Madison, Wisconsin. Tom Hall and I visited uh, at that time and we found it to be really nice as Tom used to live there while he was in college. We moved all four of us there and we continued working on our games. Only four months later, we were found dead in the snow, victim of uh, Wisconsin's brutal winters that we did not research. <laughs> Moral of the story, do your research. We knew how to program an assembly language, but not how to ask Tom Hall, hey, what are winters like up here? <laughs> so after six months, we moved down to Texas. <laughs> So new principle, great tools help make great games. Spend as much time on tools as possible. I wrote a tile editor back in 1991 named Ted. Tile editor. Ted was used for 33 shipped retail games, several of which were 3D games, like Hover Tank, Catacomb 3D, Wolfenstein 3D, Spear Destiny, Rise of the Triad, Corridor 7, and others. So it was January 1992, we decided to go all 3D based on Catacomb 3D's promise. It looked cool, but it just didn't really play cool. So Wolfenstein 3D took us four months of development time to get to its share or launch with one episode of Levels. It took two more months to finish all six episodes and the hint book. The first month, it sold 4,000 copies, all priced at $60 each. Spear Destiny took two months. It's a prequel to Wolf 3D, and it was retail only. Soon after, Tom Hall traveled to Kentucky to work for a couple months on Wolfenstein VR. Yes, this was 1992 VR. Back in the days of Commander Keen, I had discovered a small three-person team, a three-person game company called Raven Software in Madison, Wisconsin, and I called them up and we went over and introduced ourselves. And flash forward seven months later, we did a little bit of work with them by modifying the Wolfenstein 3D engine and licensing it to them for a game called Shadowcaster. That's Shadowcaster. Shadowcaster's tech improvements were sloping floors, lighting, and fog. 
This engine looked slightly better than Wolf 3D, but it wasn't good enough for our next game. So John Carmack spent some months thinking about how more advanced the new engine should be for the game that we decided to call Doom. Based on the rapid development of our previous games, we came up with another important principle. We are our own best testing team, and we should never allow anyone else to experience bugs or see the game crash. Don't waste other people's time. Test thoroughly before checking in your code. No throwing it over the fence for testers to find, put a bug in the database, and then fix it later. It's a wasteful cycle. So after 1992, id Software's second stage of company development was complete, along with another principle. As soon as you see a bug, you fix it. You do not continue on. If you don't fix your bugs, your new code will be built on a buggy code base and ensure an unstable foundation. If you check in buggy code, someone's going to be writing code based on your bad code, and you can imagine how much waste that's going to create. So the ideas for Doom came from our D&D campaign, which was full of demons. We also loved the movies Evil Dead and Aliens. Doom's design was a mashup of a bunch of ideas. At the beginning of Doom's development, we created a new core principle. Use a superior development system than your target to develop your game. So before Doom, we were making games for DOS while we were developing using DOS computers. And we knew that we could do better if we used more powerful computers and a more advanced operating system to develop our games. So we developed Doom using Next Step workstations. They were far superior to DOS. Next Step eventually turned into OS X and then Mac OS recently. This also meant that one of our core principles was upheld, great tools help make great games. So we could make far better tools on Next Step. Doomed and QuakeEd were two of the most important tools we had. This is a Next Step desktop. It's 1024 by 768. They both really helped us create levels and test them very quickly. Uh, you might not have known this, but we had five people on our team creating Doom. <laughs> After Tom Hall left, about halfway through, we hired Sandy Peterson and Dave Taylor, which brought us up to six total people making Doom. We also did the Super Nintendo port of Wolfenstein 3D right in the middle of Doom's development. It took us three weeks because we had to learn how to program the Super Nintendo hardware. So we uploaded the shareware version of Doom to the University of Wisconsin server on December 10th of 1993. The excitement for the game was unprecedented. People were creating files in the upload directory that were sentences like when.will.we.c.doom. We got random phone calls in the office asking when it would be out. Everybody knew it was going to happen. So time for a quick story. Uh, during the final day of Doom's creation, we worked 30 hours in one day. We had the game running on all the computers in the office to ensure it was solid. However, on a couple computers, the game froze. The menu could be brought up, but the gameplay stopped. John Carmack thought about what could possibly be happening, and he figured out the solution without doing any debugging. So he was correct in his solution, and, after, and we finally uploaded after a five-minute fix and more testing. At the beginning of 1994, I started working with Raven Software and developed Heretic using the Doom engine. I wanted to see how an inventory system in a medieval version of Doom would play. It turned out great. Does anybody here remember Heretic? Some people? All right. Um, we also made Doom 2 in 1994 in eight months, and it was released on October 10th. Uh, in addition to this, we did the Jaguar port, Doom port ourselves. Again, we were multitasking and making multiple games, so two in 1993 and three games in 1994. In 1995, we started working on Quake. We had nine developers at that time, four designers, three coders, and two artists, and I was the only person uh, that did both coding and design. I wrote QuakeEd and experimented with level design in full 3D. Again, we started with a clean code base. No code from Doom was used in Quake, which was another of our principles of development. 
uh, write your code for this game only, not for a future game. You're going to be writing new code later because you're going to be smarter. Also, you're not tying yourself down to the limitations of your past code. Invent new things. Quake's engine was being developed by John Carmack and rasterization by Michael Abrash. John Cash worked on the network code, and he went on to become the lead programmer of World of Warcraft. Time for a quick story. Um, so this relates back to our belief that developing in a superior operating system can result in a better game. While making Quake, we had a deal with Cray Supercomputers to buy a Cray YMP for half price. Our plan was to have our development team connect it, uh, connected to it to BSP and light our maps, as well as crunch whatever new kinds of data that we would create with our next game's engine. The computer room in Quake's DM3 level was going to be full of Cray computers as a reference to this new hardware that we were going to acquire. That's how we would get half price, by putting Cray computers in Quake. Unfortunately, Cray was bought by Silicon Graphics before Quake was done, and the whole deal fell apart. So the computer room in Quake's filled with the usual rectangular mainframes instead of the C-shaped Crays. So after publishing Heretic, I started working with, Ra with Raven on Hexen. I wanted to see how an FPS would play with a hub-level system and character classes. Hexen launched on October 30th of 1995 during the Deathmatch 95 event that was happening at Microsoft in Redmond. A month later, I got Raven started on my next design, which was called Hecatome. It would be the third game in the series, Heretic, Hexen, and Hecatome. Hecatome was never finished. It was turned into Hexen 2. During this time, we noticed a small game company making some nice games, like Raptor Call of Shadows, and we brought them down from Illinois to make a game that we would publish. They called themselves Rogue Entertainment, and about 14 months later released Strife, which used the Doom engine. It was an FPS RPG, and it was really fun. It showed the combining genres could actually make a fun game. Also during 1995, we made the Ultimate Doom, which was a retail version of the full version of Doom with an extra episode, and we also made the master levels of Doom that year. Its software was still nine developers in size, and we released two games in 1995 while we're working on Quake. So we're continued on Quake, and 14 months after starting, we released Q-Test on February 24th of 1996 for the world to test our first internet gameplay. So during the next four months, we worked very hard to complete Quake. We also released Final Doom, released by Team TNT and the Casali Brothers, and Death Kings of the Dark Citadel, which was an additional set of levels for Hexen. One important principle that helped us get Quake done faster was this one. Encapsulate functionality to ensure design consistent consistency. So examples of this in Quake would be the torches on the walls. We could have made the level designers place a torch model, then a fire model that animated, then a torch sound entity, all at the same location. But then, if we move, needed to move a lot of stuff around in the level, something could have gotten left behind. It was far easier to just create a torch entity that had all the functionality built into it, and then just place the torch. Also, water in the game needed sound effect entities all over the place to fully cover the water areas so you'd hear it everywhere. If the water got modified in the level, moving all of those entities around and deleting some would have been a mess. So it was easier to make the game play water sound whenever water was actually being rendered to the screen. So it was a renderer, a renderer level feature, and it was out of the designer's hands. So it ensured consistency, and it saved memory. And we did the same thing for the Sky Audio in Quake. So <clears throat> I released Quake Shareware on June 22nd, at 5.30 p.m. on the University of Mad Madison at Wisconsin's site. University of Wisconsin. Okay, time for a quick story. While Michael Abrash was programming the renderer for Quake, he was, he was interleaving CPU uh, assembly language instructions with FPU assembly language to calculate perspective correct texture mapping. And sometimes while he was playing the game, for one frame, the game would show a completely different part of the map. 
And so he isolated the only instruction where that could happen and determined that it was impossible for it to be an invalid value. He had a friend from Intel come over and go through his analysis, and his friend <clears throat> agreed with him. And then he said, oh, there's a known error with the floating point divide instruction on the Pentium, on the 486. It was, <clears throat> it was a hardware error. So there was nothing that we could do about it, so we just left it alone. And the bug is known as the Pentium FDiv bug, which you can actually look up. So Quake is the game that introduced the world to mouse look, high-speed, true 3D world, and internet multiplayer. Clans sprung up immediately, as did esports and tournaments everywhere. Quake World launched five months later. And so <clears throat> making games was, and it still is, our life. We love it more than anything else, as you can tell by our release of 28 games in five and a half years by less than 10 people. Many other games were released that used our license technology over the years. And so here are some more core principles that we learned from all of our work. Try to code transparently. Tell your lead and peers exactly how you're going to solve your current task and get feedback and advice. Do not treat game programming like each coder is a black box. The project could go off the rails and cause delays. Programming is a creative art form based in logic. Every programmer is different and will code differently. Don't waste time focusing on a rigid coding style. It's the output that matters. So thanks for coming to the Yorkshire Games Festival's very first year, and hope you like the talk. Well, uh, thank you, John. That was very interesting. Thank you very much. Um, we're going to have a Q&A session now, um, so I'm sure no one's got any questions. Uh, hi there. Um, with the advent of um, uh, game engines now, obviously a lot more sophisticated, um, thinking of Unreal, Unity, etc. Um, how important is, uh, is programming skills? I mean, obviously I know they're important, but to what extent? I mean, as a, maybe as a percentage um, of, of a game, is now programmed with original code, um, and what percentage is generally done with uh, purely in game engine, using using tools such as blueprints, etc. Um, yeah. So, in commercial game development, when you let's say you use a Unreal Four, right, which is a really advanced game engine and has a ton of features in it, and blueprinting is great because it lets you visually look at basically like programming, where you're connecting inputs and outputs. Um, when you're working on a commercial game, let's say for consoles or PC, and you're using Unreal 4, the blueprints are only there to do the prototyping of the game's gameplay features. When you actually are, are, are you have something working with blueprints, you basically delete all the blueprints and you implement it in C++. Is that, is that so, for optimization and... Uh... Yeah, well that's because C++ is super fast and the blueprints are all... all um, they're interpreted. Yeah, sure. So um, you basically got to go full speed. And of course, it takes programmers to do that. So, um, you know, there are some some uh, games where, uh, let's say, I was using Renderware back when I was making Gauntlet, and Renderware didn't have any networking code, so that all had to be written from scratch. And then the the renderer uh, for Renderware actually wasn't that fast, and uh, on on Xbox or on PS2 at the time, and so we had to rewrite the entire renderers on both those platforms. Um, so a lot of times they use, uh, game companies will use an engine to get a game project going, and as it's going, they start replacing pieces of the project with their own code because they want different shaders, or they just want a completely different pipeline for something, or they want to add a scripting language to it that's not included in the engine. So there's a lot of reasons why you have to have programmers on a game, commercial game. Sure. Um, so it's a, it's it's a ton of work. There's there's when you look at the teams of people working on these games, um, there are just hundreds usually, and it's not hundreds of artists. <laughs> it's it's a lot of programmers, but thanks, definitely yeah. more artists and programmers. Very helpful. Thanks. Okay. Thank you. Anyone else? Um, hi. Um, I was wondering what um, what do you think would make a like? What do you look in for? A, development team like what would you think will make the best development team like 
So uh, putting together a development team is probably one of the most important things that you can do when you're going to make a game with other people. Um, it's very important that the people that you choose on your team have a culture match with you. They have a personality match. They have a, an interest match. So a lot of times teams fall apart when people, they get together, but somebody's not as excited as the other people, so they don't work as hard as the others, and, and the others are going to gang up on them and just get rid of them, usually. Um, uh, or, or else the whole thing will fall apart because some people are mad that they're not getting kicking the other people out and it just becomes political. Um, so when everybody is at the same interest level, that's really important. Everybody has, has agreed on working hours and, and tasks and all that. Um, and that everybody has the same kind of personality and they're not getting on each other's nerves. Um, it's really important. And then, of course, what the technical level or the skill level is for whatever the disciplines is also important because everybody needs to be, if everybody's at a very beginner level, then everyone is used to everyone being at beginner level. It's not that big of a deal. If everyone's at a very high skill level, then everyone would be expected to be at that high skill level. So a lot of times um, they do have big, big teams that have all the different skill levels from juniors all the way to seniors. Um, and that's totally understood. But in really small teams, a lot of times the small teams need to match much better than the big teams do. OK, thank, thank you. you. What's your relationship with uh, the art department? Because you know, the artists want to create something uh, quite creative where the programmers might, might find it's quite difficult to do. What's that relationship like? Well. Um, it's it's uh it's pretty great. The um a really good development team relies on their art department a lot. Um, like the, it it makes it easier for the designers to come up with game design and mechanics, and gameplay features when they know that they don't also have to visualize and tell the the artists exactly how the art should be because that's kind of the artist's job. So um, design would basically talk to the the lead artist or the art, you know, whoever's doing whatever part of the project, let's say characters, and just say, here are the different kinds of characters we have in the game. And at the very beginning of a game project, uh, the art department is trying to figure out what is the style of this game's art. What's the, and they create a style guide. And usually they create a bunch of different styles for everybody to kind of choose from. And when they choose the style, then that's the style that the entire art department's going to do the art in. And then when there's like, hey, we need a company logo, it's the art team that gets to do it. You know, We need these characters. The art team gets to create the characters. They get to create all the animation. They get to do everything that people see on the screen. It's all done by artists. And um, really good teams let the artists do all of that and not have designers tell artists, oh, hey, change that pixel or change that triangle. Like, that's, that's not the job of the designer. It's the job of the art department. Hi. Um, uh, oh, first of all, thank you for um, thank you for talking t to us today. And uh, <clears throat> um, you started you basically like started your own um, your own company like uh, from the grounds up. So I was wondering now with like uh, with like AngelList and uh, um, Kickstarter, it's easier to start up like a company in terms of finance, but. Um, in the pictures, like you had like three computers already, and I was just wondering, like, where did you get the the finance to to afford like all of the equipment you had to begin with? So um, when we started in software, we actually did not have really computers ourselves. Um, I had a computer at home. Um, I was an Apple II person for the entire '80s, and so I bought that back in the '80s. My parents bought my first one, then I bought my second one when I was graduating high school. Um, and then um, when I was working at SoftDisk, I made a deal with SoftDisk. If I, if I did some games for them on the side, like educational stuff, then they would buy me this, this certain computer, a 386SX16. And so I did that, and then I had a computer at home. Um, and, but then, you know, to, to work on the stuff that we worked on in Gamer's Edge when we very started, started working together, those were company computers, they're 386-33s. In fact, at that time, were the best computers in the whole, the whole company of like 90 people. And, and so they were so good that we were basically using them at night, and then we were taking them home on the weekends. So we didn't have our own computers when we were making Commander Keen. But as soon as Commander Keen came out, our very first 
royalty check was for ten thousand five hundred dollars, and that was after one month of sales, and that was half the money that the game made in the first month. And this is just there's no advertising. It was just on a BBS, so people would have to dial into a BBS and then see Commander Keen, you know, thing come up and then download it. So it was. No advertising, but it was it was everybody loved the game. So as soon as the money came in, we immediately bought computers, and then we had our very first computers. And, and what we did from that point on was, um, we the, the the game was making really good money, but we we basically saved all the money in the company account. And um, at the very beginning, it was still pretty shaky with cash. But we you know we quit Softdisk one month after you know one month after releasing Keen. And two weeks after getting our first check, we just quit. And of course, we're hoping that the money is going to keep coming in. Um, and when it did come in, we kept it in the bank. And we only um, we decided between the four of us founders that we would only take the money that we needed to live. So each of us actually took different amounts of money because some of us had more like a car payment or whatever. And some of us didn't. So at the very beginning, it was, it was uneven. But it was, it was more important that we actually could work together than money. So um, after the money kept on getting you know, bigger and bigger, then we could actually become equal on how much money that we were taking for salaries, which was still really low. Um, but we kept on investing the money in the company so we could buy better and better computers over time. So we didn't get money in and just split it between all four of us and have an empty bank account. We, we took the minimum that we needed for years. So how, um, like in, in the context of now, um, uh, how important is like finance if you want to start like a, a business or something so uh this is something that <laughs> we get asked all the time and the best way to start a company right now especially if you're students is don't go looking for any money you need to spend your time at night working on your own game you own the whole thing nobody else has it and nobody else is paying you to make something awful because your first games are not going to be good <laughs> I guarantee it. So you're going to be making experimental stuff, and you're going to have to do many games before it becomes something that's really, really marketable. Um, but do it on your own time and get used to doing it because you're going to own everything. And, and if somebody gives you money, they usually own the idea that you are making, and they get a big chunk of the money that you're going to be, that's going to be coming in and a chunk of the company that you have. So it's, it's a big deal to try and get other people involved. It's smarter to just do it all yourself, um, which is what we did with id Software. You know, we created our own games. And before id Software, I created all those games uh, at home on my own. And, um, and then the company could actually start making money uh, from that. And we just c continue doing the same thing. We make the games that we want. Nobody else has a stake in it. There's no outside money coming in. Uh, id Software actually owed no money to anybody ever during its existence, um, because we always kept our, we always saved our money. We didn't spend it all, because uh, we were, we we're, we we're just happy to make enough money to actually make the next game. So you don't need money to make games. You could go home tonight and make games. You don't need permission. Just okay. do it. Okay. And it, John, thank you. You, you've given us a gold mine of advice there. So thank you so much for that. Um, you describe an astonishingly prolific publication of games. I'm, I'm amazed that you made so many games. So do you regret releasing any of them? And what lessons did you learn by making quite so many? Um, well, you learn a lot when you make a lot of games, because uh, you fail a lot. And you know, failure leads to success. So you have to do a lot of that to, to get really good. Um, if anyone has read the book Outliers, it's, it's totally true that you need 10,000 hours to achieve mastery in something. And um, by the time we got together at id Software, it, I'd been several tens of thousands of hours at that time. Um, but you have to also push yourself to learn more and do better. You, you know, it's easy to be in, an, in a, an industry for 30 or 40 years and never do anything past a certain point. You can coast forever after you get to the point where you actually get a job, but that's not how you're going to get great. So you have to keep on pushing yourself. And so when I made a ton of these games, my goal for every game was to learn something new. So I could say, oh, when I made this game, I was trying to figure out how to do a random ma maze generation. And then with this game, I was trying to learn how to read the joystick and use that for input. And with this game, I was trying to do music. And you know, like every game had a learning, uh, a learning goal attached to it. 
So, um, you know, games that I wish that I hadn't released, um, you know, that's tough. May, you know, maybe Daikatana would be one of those games. Um, but I made so many games that were far worse than Daikatana. <laughs> but one thing that people always ask, they always like, oh, you're going to be the guy who asks about Daikatana. Um, Daikatana was made by an entire team of people that had never made a game in their life except for me. So I hired a bunch of people off the internet that had a lot of passion uh, for level design and scripting and stuff, just like I had passion at home to make games as well. Um, and so I brought a ton of people in to the company to make this game, and it took three years and a lot of people, you know, people leaving and bringing more people in until finally it got to the, the point where we had replaced people with people that actually knew how to make games, and then we could actually release a game. Um, but it was uh, it was a team that had never made a game before, so it was a, it was a learning process. Don't do that. <laughs> okay, thank you. Any more questions? Hello, thanks for being here. Um, as a software developer, what do you think is the most important thing someone needs to consider when making game? Learn, uh, know, have as a skill? Um, well, design is really, really important. You know, no matter what you do on a game, the design of the game means everything. Uh, you could be the very best programmer in the whole world working on the stupidest game design and nobody's going to know who you are, right? But have an amazing game idea and be competent enough to create that idea and you get Minecraft. You know, you get these amazing games because the idea is far more important. So um, it's important, like when you're learning how to code, it's very important to know how to get that technical skill down, be, get good at coding if you're coding. Um, but at some point, you then want to start designing. You want to be able to make your own games. And, uh, and now it's like, I know how to write, now I'm going to come up with the novel. You know? So now you know how to program, now you can come up with the, the game design. And you've got to focus on getting better and better at game design. Um, but also just coding in general, I think, as a base skill, is important for anybody that's on a game team. In fact, I think in high schools, they should be teaching C instead of French or Spanish. Yeah, I think it's a more important language. Um, so learning a little bit of programming, if you're an art student, uh, will make you rise above many other artists. Like anything that you can do, if you can become a technical artist, you are a more sought after artist. So some technical profici proficiency in today's world I think is really important. Okay. Uh, I would just like to know what's your opinion on the current game state of the games industry as you'll get big companies that will release content, but then they'll make you pay for extra content even though there's still bugs within their vanilla content. Um, and they don't bother fixing them. Yeah, that's, uh, I mean, that's, it's better than it used to be. Back in the, back, in, back before demos existed, you had to look at a box and hope that it was good. And you paid the same amount of money back in the, you know, 1980, you would pay 30 or 40 dollars for a game based off of a Ziploc baggie and the, the, the cardboard printout and hope that it was a good game. And things have progressed you know, very far now to where you can actually look at a demo for a game and you can read lots of reviews. There's an internet now. You know, back then you had to wait months for a magazine to get the, print, you know, get, get the printed review out before you could buy it. So it was hard for games that, that were released to sell on day one like they do you know, selling half a billion dollars worth of Call, Call of Duty today. Um, so, you know, DLC, if you like the game enough, you know, it's, it's totally worth it. There are games that are free to play, um, that are like episodic, not, not microtransaction. That's one way of doing it. Um, then there's games that cost some money, uh, that then in the game will, could, could charge you for more DLC, like Fallout 4, right? There's like six, six DLCs now. And the thing is, if you love the game, you're gonna pay for the DLC. <laughs> it's really, is you're paying for more time to play the game with more stuff. And you gotta look at the fact that it does cost a ton of money to make that stuff. And they can't just do it for free. They have to, they have to make money off DLC. Um, and computers are really, when you have a game that's really complex and computers are really complex, uh, the code bases of these games could be you know, in a million lines of code. Um, and it is just very costly to keep that up and to not like make it all crash when you add some features. So it's just, it's a big endeavor to, to, to add DLC to a game. 
Um, but you know, I I think it's fine. I totally. I used to play World of Warcraft every day uh, for six hours for five years and twelve hours on the weekends. And I gladly paid so much more money to Chinese gold farmers than actually paying for the subscription. <laughs> Hundreds of dollars a month. Uh, just another side question. But do you think that they should release the DLC before actually fixing the vanilla bugs? Um, it depends. You know, there's priorities on. Um, and what things they think people would like more. Like maybe there's some DLC features that they think people would like more than some of the vanilla fixes. Um, it's up, it's, it's just a prior, it's all prioritization and it's actually within the team, if you're in a game company, you find out how complex their production is, their prior to prioritization schemes. It's not as clear as, as what you would think on the outside saying, why don't they fix that first? That's stupid, like we all hate this thing, but now they're adding the dune buggies or something. Um, but then you find out internally that if they do this, it really messes up all these other things. And the DLC was based off of the current status, and so we can't release the DLC. Like we need to release the DLC, then we got to fix a vanilla bug for the next DLC. You know, so there's a there there are dependencies that you don't know about that make them release the things in the order that they do. Okay, thank you, John. I've got time for two more questions. What is your opinion on publishers putting out quite late? Um, review embargoes because Bethesda had quite a late one with Doom 4 so that was quite concerning for a consumer if you wanted to like find out how good the game was before you wanted to make a purchasing decision um, well it works for Apple <laughs> nobody can buy anything the day that Apple announces stuff well, sometimes you can at WWDC but you know it works really well for Apple if people want something that badly they're going to wait for it Sometimes they want to spoil the surprise. Um, sometimes they don't. They want things embargoed just because they they uh, they might be fixing some stuff really up to the up to the minute. Um, so I'm fine with it because back in the day you were lucky to get reviews a month later. Okay. One final question. Hi there. Um, I got a question about like. How important is it for an artist to learn any sort of code, no matter how minimal it is? Like, is it incredibly important, or like, would you even bother? Um, it's really easy. Like, you would not believe how easy it is to learn how to program. Um, so, if you go to coronalabs.com and you download Corona SDK, the language that it uses is called Lua, which is even simpler than C. It's about as simple as a programming language gets. And you can have an empty file and write one line of code, and you can have stuff up on the screen, one line of code. About five more lines, now you have physics and objects bouncing stuff on the screen. Um, they've made it very, very simple. It's 2D, so it keeps it very, very simple, and it's extremely fast. The language Lua is very fast, but the APIs to the graphics drivers, they use Metal on, on Apple devices. And, um, and they use the latest APIs on desktop, so you can do Windows, you can do Android, you can do uh, Mac OS X, and you can do iOS and, and, and some other stuff that people don't use. Um, but it's really easy, and I, I've, I've talked to artists before who they really wish they, they're really good at art, but they want to make their own game because they have their own ideas, and they just hate having to try to find a programmer to make their idea happen. And so I've, I've told people about this, and they come back a month later and like, I can't believe how easy it was. Like that was ridiculously easy. The hard part was the mental block they had in their head thinking that programming was all math, which most programming doesn't go beyond adding, subtracting, multiplying, dividing, unless you're gonna do graphics programming, where you need 3D, and you need, you need matrices, and you need to do vectors and look at and all that stuff. Unless you're, if you're just programming 2D stuff, simple fifth, sixth grade math, is all it takes. So you don't hit a math wall, and the concepts for programming are very simple. And if you, you use something like Corona, the language has been ex exhaustively explained, and it's very simple. And there are guides and tutorials all over the place for Corona to teach you how to connect it to Proton and start doing multiplayer games and, and uh, getting graphics on the screen. And it's really, really fast. So you'd be surprised how easy it is to program. If you go use Corona SDK. So uh, artists learning how to program makes him 100 times more employable. Absolutely. When, when a company looks at a resume that has a, an artist that has a skill and anything that they need, and then they know how to code, 
<laughs> and if you can show it, like that's really important that your portfolio does, you know, you're, you're showing your, your art and your portfolio, but then if you can show the actual video of the game on your web page, a video of it playing, and stuff that says, I programmed this in Corona SDK using Lua, da da da, da then you're, you're at the top of the pile immediately. You're like, we need this person. Yeah. <laughs> that's that sweet spot I was talking about earlier. Okay, thank you very much. So uh, I'd like you to put your hands together, please, for John and, uh, and his fantastic tour. Thank you. Thank you very much. It's been fun.